Good morning. A couple of weeks ago, even less, the internet kind of died for, uh, for 24 hours. Right? There was no Twitter, there was no uh, Facebook for a lot of people here in the UK, and worst of all, there was no Reddit. Right? It was, uh, it was a moment of panic. And the question is, like, I wonder how many people here know why that happened. Right? So what happened was we saw a DDoS attack, a denial of service attack, sort of like a massive spam attack on the very backbone, one of the backbone providers of DNS, the, the internet backbone. And the entirety of that attack was only possible today because there are tens of millions of little internet connected devices out there today, right? Little cameras, uh, uh, little, little temperature monitors in people's homes, and all of them are connected to the internet because they're all feeding this thing of the internet of things. And so suddenly, the scale of attack and the scale of the internet went from a human scale, right, where people have their own device, you know, like their own laptop or their own phone, to a robotic scale, where there are millions of bots for every human. So this is frightening for anyone who's building an internet business. But I think one of the interesting things that we're seeing is uh, in a blockchain world, in a digital commerce world, right, where you have millions of these connected bots and they're all performing commerce, what we are going to see when all of these systems turn on, when uh, uh, drones and phones and fridges and microwaves can all start interacting and performing transactions automatically, we're going to see a non-human scale of transactions, of financial and economic and monetary transactions. And it's going to turn on and it's going to feel like a DDoS attack on our financial systems. This is a problem that uh, Epiphyte has been looking at for a few years. It's one of the driving motivations of why we decided to build Epiphyte. My background is uh, just before Epiphyte, I was uh, working at what at the time was the fastest growing and largest uh, games company in the world, Zynga. All right, so Zynga, we released Farmville. We got 150 million players, and we saw a scale of microtransactions that no one had ever seen before. Cut to five years later, and uh, uh, a few months ago, uh, this game, Pokemon Go, was released, right? Yeah. And Pokemon Go exploded to the scale that we had seen in Farmville, right? What we had done in Farmville in a year, Pokemon Go did in four days. 150 million players in four days. And that was before that even launched globally. They were making $6 million a day, and they had hardly figured out how to monetize their app. So we're going to see more and more of that. Virtual worlds, monetizable bots. There's going to be a huge amount of transactions happening that we are not prepared for. So I'm going to get into a little bit about what Epify does and who our customers are. But before I do that, I'd like to ask, is there anyone in the room who's a banker? <laughs> wow, this is an unusual blockchain conference. <laughs> Is there anyone here who has Bitcoin? Yay. Yeah, okay. And is there anyone here who's actually used it for something? Not speculation. All right, cool. So you guys are living in the future, which is not yet evenly distributed. And what we're trying to do uh, at Epiphyte is we're trying to bring these guys into the future as well, right? And uh, I know that other people in the room have been working with them as well, and you know that it is a soul-crushing experience. <laughs> I used to be human. Not so much anymore. And the reason we're trying to do that is two things. First of all, that's where all of the customers are. And second, that's where all of the money is. And so what we've been doing is we've been trying to help these customers um, and you know, the proverbial my mother, because like my mother is actually like one of those proverbial mothers. She like can't stand technology and will only use things if they're super, super simple and familiar. We're trying to bring our world, which is very, very geeky, to 
that more mainstream world. And it's kind of perfect dovetail uh, uh, from the Open Bazaar conversation. If we want to get people to be able to use things like Open Bazaar, we need to make the payments super interoperable and super easy. And so that's what we're trying to do. And we believe that the biggest thing that open blockchain systems do, the biggest advantage they provide, is they provide instant and ad hoc interoperability between payment systems. All right? What they do is they allow non-trusted parties to perform trusted transactions. And they can do this at scale. The reason the current financial world is not ready for the mass of micro transactions and automated transactions which we're going to start seeing over the next five years is because at its very base the problem of interoperability that is currently being solved in the current monetary system is being solved as a liberal arts problem right like if i want my system to inter be interoperable with your system i sit I put my compliance people and my business development people in a room with you. We spend six months to two years hashing out a relationship. We create Nostro and Vostro accounts. And now, finally, we're somewhat interoperable. And so what a transaction today inside a payment system like PayPal looks like is fast, easy, and basically risk-free. But try to perform a transaction between payment systems. Try to send money from your bank account to PayPal. Try to do a, a transaction between Visa and MasterCard accounts and you discover that it becomes slow, expensive, risky or impossible. And the one fabric that can sit between these systems is an open blockchain system. So what Epified has done is we're, we believe that that's the future. And the question is how can we build a global infrastructure, a global uh, payment uh, interoperability system on open blockchain systems and do so in a, way, in a way where it's going to be valuable today. So uh, the problem of this lack of interoperability, the problem of inefficient transactions today uh, expresses itself in many, many places. But the one place it expresses itself most is in international transactions, right? If you try to perform a transaction from one bank, even in a developed country, let's say in the United States or mostly developed country like the United States, right, to another developed country like Japan, that transaction between two bank accounts can take three to five days and can cost you uh, $25 plus 2% uh, of the transaction in FX fees. It's an incredibly expensive proposition, even for the largest uh, uh, corporations. And the reason it looks like that is because the problem of trust is being solved like a liberal arts problem in an entirely non-scalable way. You've got the U, one U.S. bank has a relationship with the Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve has a relationship with another corresponding bank and so on in a chain which is called corresponding banking and, and sits at the very basis of our, of our transactional systems today. And where we see this worst is with remittance payments because remittance payments are typically going in small chunks. In other words, for customers that it's not worth bothering to optimize your systems for and they're going to the countries which are most difficult. So, for example, you know, I, I've been talking a lot about this guy called George. Right? George, um, uh, I, I, I got to know George because George is a Nigerian immigrant to the UK. He uh, cleans the building in which our headquarters are based 10 minutes from here. And George is salt of the earth, right? George is, is like, what we would all wish our kids to grow up to be like. He's hardworking, he's thrifty, he saves, he sends money back home. He left one country uh, to go to an unfamiliar country. He goes to night school. He spends three hours, you know, commuting every day between his job, school, and the work, and the place that he lives, which is in like zone six in London, which for those of you who are unfamiliar with London, is basically Scotland, <laughs> all right? This, this guy is salt of the earth. And then he goes to send money back to his family in Nigeria and he'll stop at a little hair salon where they are also a Western Union agent. The Western Union will take from him 13.5 pounds in a fee and then they will take, um, we, we, we monitor this on a daily basis, but on average between four 
to 12%. For Nigeria, this is the fluctuation you see with just one country, 4%, 4 to 12% in FXV. He ends up paying on a 200 pound transaction, which is the smallest he can do because otherwise it just becomes too expensive. Right? So he scrounges, gets together this cash, and he's paying 10 to 15% commission. Now, a lot of great companies have come out in the world uh, over the last few years to try and improve the remittance problem, right? World Remit, Azimo, TransferWise, they have done an incredible job of reducing the costs of remittances, especially um, inside Europe, right? So if you do a remittance from the UK to Poland today, half a percent uh, of the transaction uh, is going to be your fee. The transaction will only take two days, and that's about yeah, that's, that's incomparable to what the situation was before these companies existed. But these companies have hit the limit of optimization that they are able to provide their customers because they're currently, all of them, without exception, running at a loss. And the reason they're running at a loss is because their uh, service is provided over these rails. Expensive, pre-funded, collateralized, uncertain, slow, and risky. Not words you want when you're trying to build a scalable internet startup. And so the alternative is providing a real alternative. A different way of transferring funds which bypasses uh, the international banking rails entirely. And that is what Epiphyte has built. And our customers have for most of our existence, so we're a three-year-old company, for the first two and a half years of our existence, our customers were entirely banks. Uh, and we've piloted our technology with these companies. Um, they've tested us, they've, um, they've tested our technology, and they've helped fund its development. Uh, now, we are starting to open up, and we've just started opening up our platform to non-bank financial institutions and allowing them to perform transactions, real, live transactions, right? As opposed to all of the pilots and POCs that you keep on hearing about live money moving from one country to another over non-banking rails, a true alternative to SWIFT. Um, and there's going to be, we hope, to be able to make a substantial announcement about this also on the regulatory front tomorrow, so stay tuned for that. Um, but it's incredibly exciting uh, period for us, and, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about how it works. So one of the public things that we've done is we've helped integrate Visa with uh, global remittance platforms, um, and specifically remittance platforms. And the reason we did this is because Visa, who are the largest uh, uh, payment processor in the world, are still quite small. There is a huge amount of different payments that they can't do at all. And so Visa, looking at the same problem that I started this conversation with, right? We don't have a global scalable system which can manage universal trans transaction types decided strategically that they want to become a, a network of networks. And so they've been working with us to allow themselves to be interoperable with other systems. So one of the famous things that we've done is we've begun allowing uh, transactions to begin from a Visa app. I can show you what it is here. I'm unfortunately not allowed a live demo today, but uh, anyone who wants to uh, can come later and I'll show you a magic trick where I can send a pound uh, to Africa at basically zero cost. Um, so we've, we've been working with their app and allowing them to send funds directly to M-Pesa accounts, Airtel accounts, and even bank accounts in various African countries. And basically what happens is that the transaction is converted into one or more types of digital commodity, right? Um, which some people call cryptocurrency. Right, so Bitcoin or Ethereum or some kind of derivative that exists on these systems is introduced into a payment channel so that the transfer can happen at scale and instantaneously and maintain the privacy of the, of the parties who are performing the transaction and is traded out. We, as a payment provider, never need to act as a custodian. We provide a platform which allows peer-to-peer -peer transactions even between institutions that do not have a pre existing relationship between each other, and we can route a transaction so it is converted in and out uh, of domestic payment mechanisms, and the international leg is done entirely 
over open blockchain systems. And the most important thing is, this is entirely invisible to the end user. So they are in control of their funds the entire time. They are actually using Bitcoin, but they don't need to know anything about Bitcoin or even have a wallet of their own. And George, who is the guy who helps clean our uh, offices, has been using this rather than Western Union um, through one of our partner companies as well. And the results uh, have been remarkable. So this is, comes from the exit report that we did with uh, stage two of our piloting with Visa. Uh, um, and these uh, uh, numbers refer actually specifically to Nigeria, but you'll see similar kinds of numbers anywhere in Sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia. And then in Europe, we're still competitive, but you don't get the same kind of 10x. So 85% reduction in costs, uh, versus banks, you're looking more like a 95 to 97% reduction in costs. Real-time transactions, the whole transaction will happen uh, almost instantaneously. End-to-end -end tracking of the transaction. And basically global coverage, because even though we're a small company, we can integrate with any other company that is integrated uh, with blockchain. And there's actually a surprising number out there that haven't been public about this. So this, we believe, is the future of global internet payments. And we think that this infrastructure is also going to be what's going to be ready for a world in which your customers are 90% of the time not even human, right? For what we're going to see as the DDoS of the legacy systems, and we're going to need a truly global, truly instantaneous, trustless, way of transferring funds around the world.